So anyway, now for the final project, it's going to be an extension of your first project, classification and regression, and then what gets called simple card, and the other is called J48. Uh, in Weka, it's also known as C4.5. So they have these weird names. And um, <coughs> we want to make a tree with pure nodes, and we have this data set. So what we mean by pure nodes, anybody know what we mean by that? No. Well, what I'd like, let's see if we have a picture of this. Yeah, here. So here's the tree, right? You've seen this kind of tree in Weka, right? We've, we've seen this before. So wouldn't it be great if, like, when I got to here, humidity, I had, so humidity has two possible values in our data set. Um, actually, yeah, so either high or normal. So wouldn't it be great if I knew that when outlook was equal to sunny and humidity was high, that, there, that I was absolutely sure that they wouldn't play, right? And if humidity was normal, I was absolutely sure that they would play, okay? That would be pure notes. In other words, you wouldn't get, you know, 70% chance that they wouldn't play here and 80% chance that they would play here, or rather 100% chance here and 100% chance here. In other words, what it, what it means by pure is if you do this on your, on your training data set, you get um, whenever outlook is uh, sunny and humidity is high, you get only records that were no, they didn't play. And you get only records that were yes, that they did play. Okay, that would be pure, that it separates them completely, 100% cleanly. Okay? So that would be great if we could get that, but we don't really expect that to happen, unless it's just a very small data set and it just happens to work. Okay? Now, actually, I think this is the wrong um, uh, data set because uh, I really want temperature not to be numeric and humidity not to be uh, numeric, but all of these variables to be nominal. I think that's the, I think I put the wrong thing in here, but I think later on that's what I'm using. Because here I'm using the weather nominal um, data set. This is the weather numeric one and I'm not using that. <coughs> okay, so of course you know how to do this. You open the file and you select the file. So why don't you do that now? Okay, so um, now why don't you build a J48 uh, model on this data, and you can use cross-validation, since that's what I used here, and make sure, of course, that the class variable, the thing you're trying to predict, is play. Everybody able to get it? Okay, so what kind of accuracy did you get? 50%, so nothing spectacular there, right? In fact, <coughs> kind of disappointing. But um, <coughs> um, that's what we got. Now, how do you visualize the tree, do you remember? In Weka? You right-click on the model, and it says visualize tree. And you get this, right? Okay, now, just for your, just so you can learn how to do this. Um, what, they also give you the tree here. So let's see how you read the tree this way versus the other way. Where, where did mine go now? Here it is. So, how does this, this is also the tree. So how do we read this thing? Because this is obvious how to read, right? If outlook is here, it's, it's very visual, right? But this is a little bit less visual. So how do we read it? Just see 
haven't read it. So what is it? The three words how. If outlook is sunny, then it checks humidity. If humidity is high, then it gives you a result, right? Okay, how about here? So if outlook equals sunny, then you check humidity high versus humidity low. If humidity is high, you get no. If humidity is low, you get yes. Okay? So you don't have to do it this way. You can also just have it this way. Okay? Is that, is that okay? And then what? If outlook is uh, overcast, we just predict yes right away. And if outlook is rainy, then we have to check these variables. And we get that. Okay? So we get the, they say the number of leaves and the size of the tree. The number of leaves is five. What does that mean, five? What is the, what is the leaf in a tree? The leaf is at the end of the tree, right? Right. So, what is a, what are the leaves here? What are the shapes of the leaves? They're squares, right? There are five squares. Those are the leaves, or rectangles, I should say. Okay. There are five leaves, and the size of the tree. Uh, what does that refer to? I'm not sure. What? The branches, maybe. Different, right? 
So you're going to follow the same path, right? You're going to say, like, if savings are high and assets are low and income is less than 30000 then what? Then you're going to have some good and some bad. Right? So it's not going to be a pure, pure leaf node. Right? The, the leaf, the last uh, the credit risk, if these are your only variables, right, you're going to have, if you have other variables, but no. We only have these variables. We might have more, <coughs> more records than this, but we only have these variables. Okay, so if you only have these variables, then these values are all the same, but so you'll end up at the same leaf, but you'll have some are good and some are bad. Is that clear? Okay? Okay, so anyway, but let me ask you one more question. Suppose savings are high, assets are low, and income is less than 30,000. What would you predict the credit risk is? What? I uh, know. I mean, would you say it's, suppose uh, someone now this is your data set. This is what you use to build your model. Now some new person comes in, and you've built your model, and the new person comes in, and they have high savings, low assets, and low e and this income. What are you going to predict? Are they a good credit risk or a bad credit risk? If you're going to build, if you're going to make a prediction based on your data, and this is your data. What are you going to predict? Was this a yes or no question? Uh, the question is, are you going to predict that they are a good credit risk or a bad credit risk? Bad, right? Why would you choose bad? Because three out of the five times was bad and only two was good, so, right? So you would predict bad, right? So, but you're not so confident that it's a good, good prediction, right? It could be, you could be wrong. Of course, you could always be wrong, but even the status set indicates that there's a good chance that you could be wrong, right? In fact, the status set indicates that there's a what percentage chance that you would be wrong? 40% chance, right? So 60% chance that it's bad, so of course you're going to predict bad, but you're not that confident in your predictability, right? Okay, so this is a sample of records that cannot lead to a pure leaf node, right? right? So if this is included in your data set, you're not going to have a pure leaf node. In this, for this particular note. The same values of, for the predictive variables sometimes give good and sometimes give bad. The same values for the predictor values. So you cannot use a predictor and hope to get all good on one side and all bad on the other. Okay, let's look at an example. Suppose that we have a training data set shown in this table here. So let's look at this. What do we have? We're trying to predict credit risk. What are the variables? Savings, assets, and income. Okay, we can see that savings can take on what? Low, medium, and high, and assets, same thing. And uh, incomes are, looks like they're in like $25,000 increments or something like that, right? They're recorded like that. <coughs> and we want to make a cart uh, tree to build, to, uh, to build a decision tree for predicting whether a particular customer should be classified as being a good or cre bad credit risk. In this small example, all eight training records enter into the root node. Um, since, uh, what he means by that is, uh, if you have a really big data set, you might not do that, but since CART is restricted to binary splits, so, um, so, um, when we looked at this tree, this was not a card tree. This was what? This was J48. Remember I said that card was um, this one, and this one is J48. But we're going to talk about this one today. Okay, not J48. So this one, J48, is not restricted to binary splits. Because here, you have three possible values. Okay, you can split it three. But when you're making a, a cart, you're res that, that's restricted to binary splits. 
Okay? Uh, since card is restricted to binary splits, the candidate split that the card algorithm will evaluate for the initial partition at the root node are shown in Table 6.3. Although income is a continuous variable, CART may still identify it, identify a finite list of possible splits based on the number of different values that the variable actually takes in the data. So, um, what was that figure here? So, um, here's what they mean by candidate splits. So the question is, we could split with um, savings, and we could have, because savings can be low for the left side, and for the right side we would split medium and high. Right? Remember, savings, uh, savings actually has three possible values, right? But we're going to make a binary split out of it, so what do we have to do? We have to group two of them into one split, one, one branch, and one of them into the other branch. Okay, so one way we could do that is we could have um, the left child node be low and the other side be medium and high. Okay, or we could have the left child node be medium and have the right side be low and high. Or we could have uh, this one be high and these two, and this one be low and medium. Right? Does that make sense? You know what I'm talking about? So we're going to build a binary tree. Binary means just uh, two splits. So if we're going to use savings at the top, we, we can consider using savings at the top, but we can only have two branches. So we, we can have, and save, but savings has three possible values, right? So how are we going to do that in two branches? We have to group two of them together, right? So we could have low here, and this would be high, comma, medium, right? So we could go this way for low, and this way for the other for the other one. Okay, All right? And then on the other hand, we don't have to use savings at the top, the root node. We could use what? Assets at the top. Again, assets also has three values, so we can have the same conundrum that we had before, the same problem we had before, so we're going to have to split and group, right? The same way. Or income. Now income, uh, what were the possible values? 75, 50, 25, 50, 100, 70, so these values, so uh, we, can, we can sort of split it up like this. We can say income is less than this versus income is greater than that. Income is less than this versus income is greater than that. Income is less than this versus income is greater than that. Okay? So we get uh, three possible values, that, three possible ways to do that as well. Okay, just that's just because of the nature of the income variable. It could have been different than that if, uh, if income had been recorded differently. Okay? There are any problems so far? What I'm talking about? So he says, although income is a continuous variable, the algorithm may still identify a finite list of possible splits based on the number of different values that, that the variable actually takes in the data. So, you know, income is, is a continuous variable. It's not, it's not a nominal variable. It's not, even a, it's not even what we call a discrete variable. It's continuous, right? Income could be all kinds of different numbers, right? You could say, I earned you know, one million point zero 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 one two 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 one 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 one. Yeah, I don't know if you could really say that, but it's sort of like that. So it's it's very. Uh, you could have many many possible values, but we can break it up into kind of classes. Okay, so uh, the training set of records for classifying uh, credit risk again, and. Um, we're going to create a function. Uh, this is kind of like our error function. So what do I mean by that? Well, what, what is, what's, um, we have to talk about this P. Anybody know what P stands for? Probability. 
Um, okay, so here are the definitions. Doesn't this look like fun? <laughs> Especially when you said, what did you just say at the beginning of class? You couldn't even remember what was it, A plus B squared? A squared plus yeah. 2AB right. plus B squared. Right. Is equal to A plus B squared, right? Yes. Yeah, right. Anyway, you're going to have to put on your memory cap for this. Okay, so let's go through it together. Um, so, let, uh, this is pronounced, I think this is pronounced phi, I think. Let phi be a measure of the, I'm sorry, I said it was the error, but it's the opposite of the error. It's the goodness, it's how good um, the candidate split S at node T is. Okay, let's see what that means. All right, now, what is V equal to? So it's, uh, it's a function of two variables, S and T, um, and T is what? the left child node, and S is, I forget what S is. What is S, I forget. What is S, anybody know? Not a fair question. Okay, anyway, let's look at the function itself. So it, it, it has this, it has this, it has this, it has this. So there are four things we have to examine, right? Now here, this part is the difference between two things, right? Right? It's the difference between this thing and this thing, of course, right? It's the difference. And then we're taking the absolute value of that. So often when we take the absolute value, it's, we, it's, it's because we want to avoid cancellation. Right? And you take the absolute value, because if you don't take the absolute value, maybe this, you know, when you do j equals 1, you'll get a positive. But when you j do j equals 2, you'll get a negative, and you, you get some cancellation there, right? Right? We're gonna, what does this sum mean? First, we're going to do j equals 1. Right? We're going to put in j equals 1, j equals 1. We're going to do some calculation here. Right? Then we're going to do j equals 2. We're going to put j equals 2, j equals 2. We're going to do another calculation. Right, but it's possible that the first time you do the calculation, you'll get a positive number, and the second time you do the calcul calculation, you'll get a negative number, and so you'll get some cancellation, right? Positive and negative, right? You get some balancing out. But we want to avoid that, apparently, here, so we're putting absolute values here. So you never get, no, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. I mean, how about, let's do it again. Take a look at this. Sorry, but let me get your attention now. Okay, I apologize, but I think I got it now. Okay, look at this notation. Given that we're uh, in the left node, so what was the left node again? Low, right? And the right node was medium and high, right? So given that we're in the left node, that means low. Given that we have low, how many of class J do we have? So, let's have, uh, so we have two classes, G and B. So let's do just the G one first, right? Right, good, good credit risk and bad credit risk, right, G and B. So let's just do the G first. So we have, um, how many in the left? We had three here, and how many were good? One, so that's one third. And the other two are here, it's two thirds, right? Okay, now how about this one? Now we are on the right node, so that was the medium high, right? the medium high, how many good, what percent good, and what percent bad, right? So let's check that. So given what we're in the uh, medium high, so not these gray arrows, but the other ones, right? The other ones. Uh, <coughs> what percent are good? So first of all, how many are there? There's, out of eight, there's five. So it's, there's five, and uh, how many of them are Good. One, two, three, four, right? 
four out of five, eighty percent, right? And the other is twenty percent, right? Right? The bad is the other is the rest. So it's twenty percent. So that's the, these numbers here. Okay. And then, all right. So now going back to this formula here. So what are we doing here? What is this calculating? That's the difference between for this is for a particular class. So it says J here and J here, so it's for the same class. So let's say for the good. Okay, for the good class, what's what are we calculating here? This this number minus this is this minus this, right? You see it? So what is that? What are we what are we examining? Um, given that we're uh, the, oh yeah, so this is the number of good, the percentage of good in the left and the percentage of good in the right, right? So what would we like that to be, a big number or a small number? Small, right? Uh, sorry, big number. We'd like it to be a big, the difference to be a big number, right? I'd like to have all good here and no good here. Right? That would be optimal. Right? Don't you agree? Right? We'd like to have all... Um, we, we said we want to have pure nodes. So we want to have all good on one side and all bad on the other. So this node classifies very well whether, someone, whether someone's going to be a good credit risk or not a good credit risk. Right? That, that would be the best. So we'd have like all good here and no good here. So that would mean that the difference between them would be very large, right? As opposed to, if they're both the same, the difference between them would be zero, right? So we don't want zero, we don't want a small difference, we want a big difference, right? So this difference here, and then we take the absolute value, because we don't care whether it's 0.33 minus 0.8, or 0.8 minus 0.33, right? We don't care about the sign, right? So we take the absolute value, okay? Everyone get that? All right, that took a lot of remem remembering, but I'm sorry, but anyway, so do you get that difference? So we, now, so what do we want this difference to be, large or small? We want it to be large, right? The larger, the better, right? Now, what are we um, summing up over what? Over J, right? Right? This, this says sum over J, right? So first we're going to put in J equals 1. So first we're going to do the good class. And then we're going to do the bad class. Right? There's only two. So J is e either the good class or the bad class. Like 1 is good class and 2 is bad class. Okay? So we're only going to do uh, two of them. But we have to do both of them. So first we do it with the good class, and we find, oh, it really splits the good really well. This, this one has all good, and the right side has all bad, for example, right? And then we want to do the same thing for the, uh, for the bad. We want to see what the difference is between um, bad in the left and bad in the right. And we, again, we want that to be large, right? So we we do it two times and we add it up. And we again, we want this sum, this, this to be large, if possible. The larger it is, the, better, the happier we are. Right? The larger it is, the happier we are. Now, the point here is that we're going to do this using um, savings as the node that we split on first. And we're going to figure out how big this thing is. And then we're going to try the same thing with assets using the as the first node. And we're going to see how big is it then if we use assets as the first node instead of savings. So suppose when we do it with savings, this is higher than when we do it with assets. Then which node should, we, should be at the top? Savings should be at the top. Should be the first node because it splits better it divides things up better than assets does. Okay? So that's the logic here. 
Okay, does this make sense? Okay, so it's not so, you know, it's not so hard actually. It's kind of a very natural thing to do. Right, we're just measuring how well it splits the data. Right? Does it make pure notes? How pure are the notes? That's all we're doing. And we're saying, would, would we get pure notes if we split with savings first at the top, or if we split with assets at the top, or with income at the top? What are we going to do if we're going to test for all of them? And we're going to say which one does the best. Okay? So, and then we multiply by this. I forget why we do this, but let's not, let's not worry too much about why we multiply by this right now because we kind of got lost already, so I don't want to make it worse. So, um, but basically you can see this is the work, workhorse. This is the engine that, that will help us to decide. Okay, does this make sense? Okay, so, uh, so this function here is, we'd like it to be as large as possible, and we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose the variable which gives us the largest possible fee. Okay? So, he said there somewhere that, um, here, no. Yeah. Anyway, so as I said here, then run through all candidate splits, meaning Oh, and sorry, all candidate splits also. That's one more thing I forgot. First of all, besides deciding which variable should go at the top, we have some other checks to do also. Because remember, we can split like this. Okay, when we split like this, we can say, okay, how big is fee? Right? But we could also split like this, have low and high together, right? And that might give us a different fee, right? And then we could also split, we could have low and medium together, that might give us a different fee. Or we could have assets at the top and have the split like this, or assets at the top and have the split like this, or assets at the top and have the split like this, and so on. Okay, so it's more than just uh, checking which variable, but also which splits, okay? But we can still use the same fee to decide what should be at the top and what should be the binary split? Okay, that makes sense? Okay, so uh, just then run through all the candidate splits and choose the best one, the one with fee. I can't read that, but it's with fee as the largest. Highest, it says highest. Okay, so this is what we get. So, uh, where is fee? This is fee. Here. So, which one is best? The split number four, right? Split number four is best, so which one was that? Here. So, the best one is to use assets at the top of the tree and split low versus high medium. Okay? Okay, so let's see, when we make the tree, do I have a picture of this tree? There it is. So we're going to have assets at the top of the tree, and then we're going to uh, split low, here, low, versus high medium. Okay, and that's going to give us the, the purest division. Okay? So this fee is me measuring pureness, right? This fee here is measuring pureness. The larger the fee, the higher the purity. Okay? So we found that the largest fee was here, so we found that the best split would be here. Um, assets, and we split, and we're going to, since we're doing a binary tree, it's going to be low versus high medium. Okay? And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, apply the same kind of logic at this node, just considering the records that go into this node. Remember, it's going to be a reduced number of records now, right? It's going to be less records. Only these records are in this node. So we're going to do it, and we're going to decide, okay, given that we're at this point, 
which um, variable should we use? Of course, we're not going to use asset. Oh, no, sorry. We might actually use assets again. But um, we're going to say which variable to use and which split of that variable should we use. OK, you understand? So we're going to get some new leaves down, I'm sorry, some new branches down here, right? And uh, blah, blah, blah. Right? Blah, blah, blah. Is that, is that a math description? But uh, actually, what they say in math is, if you go to a math conference, what they'll say is, and we wave our hands, and that means blah, blah, blah. Or that means like, and I won't explain the rest of it, I'm just, wave my hands means like uh, magic. You know, like abracadabra, right? So, and we wave our hands, and we get this result. <laughs> so, and I just said, and blah, 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 it's kind of the same thing. Okay, so anyway, um, and then we also have this one. Oh, this is the same thing. So, oh, sorry, this is the, sorry, this part here is called Q. Just the sigma, this part here is called Q, and then the whole thing is called V. Okay, and so he says Q. This is Q here. Okay, so when is Q large? Uh, it is large when the distance between the two P's, this P and this P, is large across each class. In other words, we want it to be large for the good class and for the bad class. So we want to get good splits with regard to good and with regard to bad. Now, in this case, I think it doesn't really make that much sense to say with regard to both classes because we only have two classes. So if one is good for one class, then it's going to be good for the other class as well. But in general, we might have more than two classes. So anyway, in other words, this component is maximized, this Q is maximized when the proportion of records in the child nodes for each particular value of the target variable. What's the target variable? The thing we're trying to predict, which is good or bad credit. So uh, when the proportion of records in the child nodes for each particular value of the target variable are as different as possible, right? That's what we would say. We just want to get big differences uh, between the proportions of good versus bad in the two nodes, in the two um, split, um, in the child nodes. In other words, when for each class, say the class of good credit people, the left node has all good credit people and the right node has none of them. Okay, so just repeating what we've said. So it's large when they're most pure. Okay, the other part is this part. When is this part maximized? I don't know if I'm going to get into this, but uh, when does it maximize? Recur, return. We recall that these are defined like this. The number of records, the total number of records in the left node divided by the number of records in the training set. And this is the total number of records in the right side. And then, so what is that? What is that? This is large when the proportion of records in the left and the right, okay, this is not so, not so obvious, but um, when is this large? So suppose we had 90% um, of the records were in the left side and only 10% of the records were in the right side. What would, that, what would this give you then? P, P, this one times this, that would give you 90 times 10, right? What is 90 times 10? I'm sorry, 0 0.9 times 0 0.1. What is that equal to? 0 0.09, right? Right? A tenth of, you're saying a tenth of 90% is 9%, right? Okay, now do it where you have a half times a half. What do you get? You take 50 times 50, I'm sorry, 0.5 times 0.5, what do you get? 0.25. 0 
So which is bigger, 0.25 or 0.9? I'm sorry, 0.25 or 0.09? Obviously, 0.25 is bigger, right? So if you get a large percent, a lot, mostly the records are just on one side and just a few records on this side, that is not going to be as large as if they're basically half and half. Okay, that's true. I mean, maybe you don't know that. I don't even know that that well, but that's true. If you take, like we just said, 0.9 times 0.1 is smaller than 0.5 times 0.5. And this is what? The number of records on the left side divided by the total number of records, and this is the number of records on the right side divided up. So you have to take 90% on the left and 10% on the right versus half and half. If it's half and half, this product is going to be larger. So what they're doing is they're saying they want they don't want to get trees that have most of the records on one side and virtually no records on the other side. So by putting in this factor, they're doing that. Now to be honest, I don't know why they don't want to have, you know, like most of the records on one side and no records on the other side. I can't quite imagine why that would be desirable. Maybe you can. I can't see why we want to do that exactly. But by throwing in this factor, they're, they're saying that that's what they want to do. They want to have kind of an evenly split because this number will be bigger when they're evenly split and we're going to choose based on this number. Right? So we're going to choose the one that is where the records are kind of evenly uh, sent to the left and right node. Okay, this is our decision maker. Right? This is how we make our decision. And this decision maker, they're including this in there. So they're including that idea in there that they want to have basically half and half. So I don't exactly know why that's better, but that's what they put in there. Okay? Does this make some sense? Okay? Uh, therefore, this will tend to favor balanced splits that partition the data into child nodes containing roughly equal number of records. Hence, this optimality measure, so this is, an op this is our optimality measure, right? This is what uh, we're using to decide what's best. So, hence the optimality measure prefers splits that will prov provide child nodes that are homogeneous for all classes and have roughly equal number of records. So roughly equal number of records, that's what we just said. That's this part. And what's the homogeneous mean? That means pure. Homogeneous means pure. It means basically all the same. Okay? So, so this thing, now you don't have to use this thing, right? This is some guy's uh, paper. This was a paper that was written in 1998 or something like that. He said, I'm going to use this thing to make my trees. I'm going to use this thing to decide uh, what's the better tree. What's the best node here? What's the best node here? What's the best node here? And so on. He said, I'm going to use this. You don't have to use that. He said, I want to have trees that have pure nodes. Well, that seems obvious. But also, I want to have trees that have, uh, what is it, how does he explain it here? Roughly equal, equal number of records in the, each node. So he said he wants that. So that's what, and so he ch uses this function to, to make the decision about which is best, and that's what this does. Okay, now, maybe yeah, for a thesis, uh, if you were working in data mining, you might say, well, I have some other criteria that I think is better. And, okay, so one measure of whether he made a good, um, a good tool here is uh, how well can we use it to make predictions about things, right? So if this tool works well, like when we're predicting hotel occupancy rate, maybe this would be, maybe that's, that's his, oh, he was good, his idea was good, but maybe you could think of a reason to change something in this formula uh, specifically for predicting hotel occupancy rates. Now, I have the faintest idea of what we would change in here because we were interested in hotel occupancy rates. I have no idea what, 
what would be, well, I can't see any reason to change any of it because uh, we're interested in hotel occupancy rates. But maybe that would be an interesting problem to work on, right? Maybe come up with some spe specific formula that's good for hotel occupancy rates. Uh, not this, gen maybe this is kind of a general formula that works, that's, uh, that gives a certain kind of tree, but maybe for some reason, hotel occupancy rates. Can anybody think of any, any, any kind of, any modification here? I mean, I, this seems very far-fetched to, to be able to think of anything. But we have some clever people here, I know that. In fact, all of you guys are clever. But uh, anyway. Anyway, that's just the, that's one path that we could follow, right? Is trying to improve on this formula for a specific thing, for a specific uh, task. For example, suppose you're trying to uh, predict stock prices, right? You might come up with some different formula for choosing the best top node of your tree and choosing the next node of your tree and so on. Okay, now as I said, I don't have a clue as to how you would do that, but that would be an interesting project. Okay, uh, hence the optimality measure prefers splits that will provide child nodes that are homogeneous for all classes and have roughly equal number of records. Okay, the theoretical maximum for this is 0.5. So in other words, the best you could get for this number is um, 0.5. Or in other words, this times this is 0.25. So the best number for this part is when you have 50-50 split. What time is it? 30, 30. What? 3.35. Okay. Okay, note that our node selecting machine, I'm sorry, note that this is our node selecting machine, right? This is our node selecting machine. Which node should come first? We use this to decide that, right? So note that this phi is our node selecting machine. So it will, it will, it will determine the structure of our tree. We could use some other function and we would get a different tree. And then, as I said, maybe the measure of which was the better function would be how well it performs in predicting, in, doing, in some prediction task, like predicting stock market prices or predicting hotel occupancy prices or something. So this is some guy's formula written in 1998, I think, or 1995 or something like that. Uh, but, you know, we don't have to use his formula. Right? And there are a lot of people out there who are writing things that are specific to a particular task. Like they're trying to write a specific tree formula for, you know, I'm sure there are guys in Google. In fact, we have a, uh, a former graduate of mine who's working at Google now, and I heard that he is, I think, trying to do something specifically like that, like trying to, uh, come up with a specific algorithm, a uh, specific algorithm, this is an algorithm, uh, for a particular task at Google. So he's not just using the ones that have already been published, he's trying to come up with some specific one for a particular task that they're interested in. Okay, so he might read about this one, and he might read about a whole bunch of other ones, and then maybe try and, uh, you know, make a modification of one that works better for some reason. Okay? Anyway, we could use some other function and we would get a different tree. Okay, so I'm not going to go through too much more of this. Because I think it's enough. You get the idea, right? You get the idea that we're using this kind of uh, function to decide which node to go first, what, what goes after that node, and so on. And in this way, we will generate a tree. So what they do next here is they talk about, well, what, what should we do for the next one here? Right, so I won't go through it, it's the same idea. So we just go through it again. 
and we get this kind of tree now. So we get assets, low, versus medium, high, and then uh, this node is uh, savings. Turns out that the best node, given that you're here, that savings is the best node with the split of high versus low medium. Okay? And uh, that gives you three records out of six here. I'm sorry, no, it gives you records three and six here, and gives you records four, one, four, five, and eight here. Okay? Okay, so like we said, not all leaf nodes, well, by the way, what do leaf nodes mean? The end nodes, the final nodes. Not all leaf nodes are necessarily homogeneous, right? We saw when we had this data that it will be impossible, if this is part of our data set, there are going to be some nodes that are not homogeneous because here we have exactly the same values for our variables, but we get, so we'll predict them all as either good or bad, but they're, but they're not going to be either good or bad, they're going to be good and bad. So it's not going to be truly homogeneous. So suppose that since we cannot further partition the records in table 6.1, we classify the records contained in this leaf node as a bad credit test, right, because there's three, uh, 60% uh, are bad, uh, then the probability that a randomly chosen record from this leaf node would be classified correctly is 60%, right? Because we're going to classify as bad, but it's only going to work, it's only, it's going to be about 60% accurate, since three of our five records are actually classified as bad. Hence our classification error rate for this particular leaf would be 40%, since two of the five records are actually classified as good credit risks. Okay? Okay, next is um, avoid overfitting in CART. Now, what does overfitting mean? We talked about it before. Huh? Yeah, the data, you try and fit the data too closely, I'm sorry, you try and fit the model too closely to the data, and you lose the, the, sort of the, the real signal, right? There's like a real signal, which is like a simplified uh, trend or line, and you try and get every single, you try and touch every single point. So you get a perfect fit, so you're, per you're, you're predicting perfectly for your given data, but when you go out and try and predict to the future, it doesn't work. Or when you try and predict with new data, it doesn't work. So that's called overfitting. So use pruning of the tree. So remember that if you have a tree with many, many nodes, you might be able to match your current data set almost perfectly. Okay? But uh, the fewer nodes you have, the less likely you are to do that, right? If you only have one node, it's not very likely you're going to get a perfect, you know, uh, perfect purity, right? So it's very unlikely. But if you, if you, have, if you have more nodes, you, it's more likely that you could get closer to perfect purity. But it's also more likely that you're going to overfit your data. So what they say is you, you use what they call pruning, which means reducing the number of nodes, okay? Pruning the nodes and the branches. Without pruning, we may be memorizing the training set and reducing the generalizability. By the way, that word generalizability, you can't find it in the dictionary. <laughs> but people use it anyway. So anyway, um, without pruning, we may be memorizing the training set or I should say, you can't find it in some dictionaries. Um, we may be memorizing the training set and reducing the generalizability of the classification results. One argument for this is that as each new decision node is grown, 
the subset of records available for analysis becomes smaller and less representative of the overall population. Right? So as you go down in the tree, you're getting a less representative sample of data. So therefore, um, you're less likely to be generalizing. You're, I'm sorry, you're less likely to have a general re uh, result because you're only using a limited number of records as you go down in the tree, right? So um, the subset of records available for analysis becomes smaller and smaller and less representative of the overall population. Brayman et al., so here it is, 1984, I'm sorry. It was 1984, not 1995, okay? Brayman et al. explains his way of doing this. Basically, he just introduces a penalty for the introduction of, a new, of new nodes. So, yeah, we want to make more and more nodes because we're going to get um, better, in a sense, better and better results in our training set, but in his um, in his algorithm, he introduces a penalty for the number of nodes that you in, that you include. So it's a kind of a playoff, a kind of fight between um, improved accuracy and number of nodes. So, uh, okay. Okay, now, what about the J48 tree, or otherwise known as the C4.5 algorithm? This is not restricted to binary splits. And uh, also for categorical attributes, what does categorical mean? Not, not numeric, no, same, same as nominal. Categorical, same as nominal. For categorical attributes, C4.5 produces a separate branch for each value of the categorical attribute. So we saw that at the beginning, way right back here, in our Weka. So for each value of Outlook, we get a separate branch, right? For categorical attributes, C, uh, J48 or C4.5 produces a se separate branch for each value of that categorical attribute. The method for measuring node homogeneity, homogeneity, sorry, is quite different from the CART method. So for J48, they don't use that function that we just looked at. They use something different. They use something called information gain or entropy reduction to determine the optimal split. So it's just a different means of choosing which node comes first, which node comes second, which node comes third, and so on. And uh, it, it's uh, something called, you use a concept called entropy, which is just another way of doing the same type of thing. Just a different technique, and it does produce a different tree. Okay, so sorry about the uh, confusion at the beginning of that discussion. Um, okay, what time do we finish? 3.50? Okay, let's quit now. Uh, any questions about this, in spite of the fact that I got lost for about five minutes? Okay, so the idea is so what is, what's the general idea for fee? What would you say, fee? What is, what's the purpose of fee? For, what is fee measure? The what? The purity, right? And the larger fee is the what? The greater the purity, right? And where does that come from? The main part is from that Q part, the Q function, which was, that's just this part here, and he just calls it Q. This part here, this was the main part, right? The other part was this part, but this was the main part, and how does this achieve that? Okay, how do you explain this? This is what? For a particular class, so we start with, we have two classes in our case, good and bad, good and bad credit risk. 
So to start with like good credit, credit risk, that's J is equal to good credit risk. So what does this tell me? This is the percentage of good in the left, no, left child node. And this is the percentage of good in the right child node, right? So what do we want that to be, big or small? What do you want that to be, big or small? Want it to be big. Want to have a lot of good here and just a few good here, right? And then we do the same thing for the set, the other class, the bad class. And again, we want it to be big. And this, so we calculate this, and this is for one. Uh, choosing one variable to be at the top, and then we do it for another variable to be at the top, and then we do it for another variable, we choose the one that works, that gives us the biggest fee, or the biggest Q in this case. And we also have more choices than that, because what? Because we can, even with the uh, saying, what was this, what did we say, assets? Assets at the top, we can have different splits. So we can have let, you know, asset, well, it wasn't assets, what was it? Savings, let's say savings. It wasn't savings either or something else, but same with savings. So savings, we can have the split of savings high versus low medium, or medium versus low high, so we don't know which one is gonna give us the best fee, so we test all of them, and then we do that with all the variables, and we choose the, the split and the variable that gives us the largest fee, and that's the top one. And then we're just gonna do that same thing again for the, when we go down here, you're gonna say given that we're here, which one is gonna give the highest fee, right? And so on, and that will, do, that will make, give us a, um, that will point us to a particular variable for that node and a particular split for that node, right? Does this make sense? Okay, and that's the idea here. So that's the idea of, what's this called again? This tree? No, that was J48 is, J48 has, um, has not, is not binary. J48, you can have, uh, from one node, you can have three or four branches. But in this one, this is binary, you can only have two branches. And that's why we have to group some of the values, like low and medium, into one, and high into the other. So what's this one called? Called, you remember? Cart. This one is called cart, and in Weka, I think it's called simple cart. So you can find it in Weka under simple, uh, under simple cart, and it's going to be one of the trees. So we. You used, or many of you used, I think, J48, but you didn't use uh, simple cart. But now we understand pretty clearly uh, what, what simple cart does, but we don't really understand what J48 does because we didn't study the entropy function. So we could study the entropy function, that's just a different way to make the selection about which node comes first. Okay, and that gives rise to the J48 tree. Okay, so this one is called what? Card. Card. Or, and in what it's called? Simple card. In what it's called simple card. Okay, and card stands for, let's see if I can remember, classification, but what's the A? Algorithm? And. Oh, and. and. Uh, classification and regression tree. Thank you. Okay? All right. That's all.